I hope you had a great weekend and we are ready and fresh for the second week of the school. And it's a great pleasure to have Enectali Figueroa Feliciano here. Uh, he's from Northwestern University and as usual, you know, just Google him and you'll see that's fantastic that having him here. I'm great that we're able to match the schedule because he just launched, launched a rocket next week, last week. So fortunately we could match the schedule and, and have him here. So thanks a lot for coming. And Hey, bom dia. Uh, yo no falo portugués, uh, pero hablo español, así que. Pero como quiera, we're going to talk in English today. Así que vamos allá. Um, so my name is Enectali Figueroa Feliciano. That's really hard to say in English, so I go by Tali. No, Tali, para los que saben lo que es un acento. Um, en, en, en los Estados Unidos, en, en the United States, it's Tali. So, and I got to live with it. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about dark matter from the experimentalist side. So uh, last week, you guys saw um, a lot of the theoretical motivation for dark matter, went over some of the models, went over um, a little bit of how direct detection works and a little bit about indirect detection. So I'm going to come at it from the point of view of an experimentalist. So my job is not to determine what dark matter is, but my job is to try to detect its signature in some way um, with some experimental apparatus. And so we'll uh, start going through what it takes to, uh, to be able to do that. Okay, so let me turn this on. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, dark matter from kind of a review of last week, but from the experimentalist side, really thinking about if I want to detect something, how do I go about that? How do I calculate what numbers I need? And then we'll talk about um, different technologies and how do you go about it in different types of dark matter. Um, and then we'll talk about specific uh, experiments that I work on so that I, we can go and it sort of a, as a case study of how you actually go about um, getting to that point. Now let me ask, um, how many of you are theorists? Okay, how many of you are experimentalists? Okay, so it's not too bad. Excellent, so for the, for, for the theorist, you're gonna learn um, about stuff that you might not have seen before, um, and maybe some of it will get a little bit into the weeds uh, for the experimentalist, I uh, hope that you will get something out of our discussion of the nitty-gritty of some of these things um, that may apply to your particular experiments that you work on. All right, so we're going to go over the, the, dark, the why of dark matter very quickly because you guys have already seen this uh, last week. So we already saw, um, uh, I think uh, Fabio already went over the whole astrophysics uh, argument, so you know you have the, the rotation curves and you expect if there's no dark matter to see a slow rotation curve, and you see this flat ro rotation curve. Um, and you can kind of look at, the, at, the, uh, at this velocity and see that you need this uh, dark matter halo in order to be able to explain the data. Um, we also talked about larger scales where you have clusters of galaxies and the virial theorem and having the velocities of these galaxies in these clusters uh, be too high to explain how they would be bound if you don't have dark matter, right? So that's uh, one of the first evidences for dark matter was this uh, virial theorem application of the velocity of galaxies inside of a bound galaxy cluster. If you move even further out, you can look at structure formation, so you can look at the distribution of matter in the universe, and you see all these tendrils that look like, uh, you know, neurons in a brain or something at, at a ginormous scale, and then you see that to, in order to model, uh, to, to model these things, so this is data and this is uh, simulation, in order to, to simulate those, you need dark matter to coalesce uh, the galaxies into these tendrils. And then you can go even further out and look at the entire visible uh, universe in the CMB, and you can fit these mo this uh, CMB using uh, BBN um, and uh, the Lambda CDM model, um, which 
fits with only six parameters the data very well. And you know, you saw all of this this last week, so I'm not going into any of the details. I'm just kind of reviewing where you where we are. So with these, you know, all of this data, we arrive at this uh, at this very interesting um, pie chart of what the universe is made of, where most of the most of the universe is made of you know dark dark energy, which today we're not going to talk a lot about, and uh, we have about a third of the energy matter in the universe made out of dark matter. And you know what we originally thought was us was only this little thing, and you know all the Earth-like planets, and you know people and ice cream and all those important things are all here, in that very little sliver of the universe. So we have to come to grips with the fact that what we thought was the universe was this really little thing and we're actually living in this dark universe. And we had no idea what the power of uh, the dark side of the universe was. And so we have to come to grips with that. Um, all right, so what do we know about dark matter? So again, this is mostly review. So we know that uh, we have this dynamics of galaxies. We have the, 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 the evidence for it. Um, we have a lot of evidence that it's of some sort of particle. Um, the, as, as was talked about last time, the uh, gravitational modification of gravity doesn't quite fit all the data. Um, it looks, uh, people looking for uh, clumped bits of, of matter uh, don't, are mostly ruled out. Um, it's, it has to be non-baryonic. It can't be dust. It can't be protons because of the co uh, cosmological and BBN um, uh, measurements, which again were talked about last week. Uh, so we're looking for some new particle that's non-baryonic, and it has to be here. So it has to be either stable or very long-lived. Um, it has to be neutral. Um, it has to be cold, um, and it interacts with via gravity, which is what we see. And hopefully, we don't know this, right? We don't know this for a fact, but we hope that whatever it is has some subweak uh, scale force that interacts with the standard model so that we have a chance of actually detecting it in our lab. We don't know that, but uh, many of the models do have some sort of, um, uh, of interaction. And so, you know, right now we're in a situation where the LHC hasn't seen uh, supersymmetry. They're looking for some new physics, and hopefully they will find them. But if they don't, then you know, there are other ways that we can look for what's beyond the standard model. And dark matter could end up being a Rosetta Stone, um, because we know that, as again you saw last week, none of these particles in our standard model fit the bill, so none of them can be dark matter. So we don't know how it fits in, to the standard model. And the more interesting question is, if we found it, how does it fit into a more general understanding of what's beyond the standard model? So by finding dark matter and finding its properties, we'll be able to rule out tons of models and hone in on where nature uh, actually lives in this vast parameter space of theoretical possibilities. So this is a beautiful problem in physics. It spans uh, a large, uh, a, a large uh, set of, of uh, orders of magnitude from the biggest scales in the universe to the uh, subatomic scales in particle colliders. And so this is why I personally am very excited to work in this field. All right, so, from, so again, from an experimentalist point of view, if I'm going to look for dark matter, you've already also seen this. We have our you know, dark matter hopefully interacting some way with the standard model, and you have some, uh, you have some uh, dark matter particles colliding with uh, some detector, which give you direct detection, or you can produce it, uh, which gives you um, uh, particle production at a collider, or you can look for indirect detection where it annihilates or decays or does something that produces standard model particles that we can look for. 
And so we're going to concentrate on the next couple of lectures on the direct detection part and maybe a little bit um, on Friday on the indirect detection part. Now, from an experimentalist point of view, I want to detect dark matter. The first thing I have to do is decide, okay, well, how am I going to detect it? And so I need to organize the possibilities in some way that makes sense to me. And so I asked a friend of mine, Tim Tate, you know, to uh, help me understand this, and he made a very simple uh, Venn diagram of the different types of dark matter so that I could understand him, and he came up with this. And of course, when I looked at that, I'm like, I have no idea what the heck that is, right? So, so this is an attempt to qu quantify how different dark matter models relate to each other and how they're in, you know, what they have in common and what they don't. And you can see this is a humongous mess. So from my point of view, this is not that interesting. I need to simplify this so that I can work on, okay, how do I go about detecting dark matter? So I take these and I just put them in a list. You know, you have all of these dark matter models, and there's many more. There's a, you know, tons of different things. Um, and I say, well, the one thing that all of these things have in common is that they all have some mass, and we don't know what the mass is, but I can start there. So I can write down a one-dimensional axis that has the mass of dark matter. Now, of course, when you look at that, that's an enormous scale, right? That's an, and dark matter could be anywhere in there. So I can st start at least starting to uh, classify these things by where they are in this, uh, in this matter. So we have, you know, axion-like particles. We have kind of the classical axion. We have sterile neutrinos. We have WIMPs. Then we have more exotic things that I'm just going to largely class classify as hidden sector, particles which encompass, a, a, you know, whatever type of uh, theory where there is some mediator that connects the theory to the standard model and, you know, you have this hidden sector. And depending on what you want, you can, um, you can have that, those have very, very complex or simple um, uh, models with different masses. Now, um, when I look at this, we're going to divide this, uh, this problem into from an experimentalist point of view, how am I going to detect this? How is this interacting with the standard model? So one uh, region of parameter space is going to be accessible through nuclear recoils. And so I can look for a nuclear recoil in my target, which will tell me that a dark matter particle interacted with my target. Now, um, I can look at, you know, how do I get these bounds? on these nuclear targets, so I can look at silicon, and I can say, okay, well, given the mass of the dark matter, I know the density of dark matter from the astrophysics, so I know how much uh, energy there is in this room. So if I know the mass, I know how many particles there are. And I know the velocity, uh, we'll, we'll go over that a little bit more in detail, so I can kind of get how much recoil energy I'm going to get if a dark matter particle hits a atom in my target. And when I do that, I can get the maximum recoil for a dark matter particle that is bound in the galaxy. So it hasn't flown away, so it has to be bound. There's a maximum speed. So what's the maximum recoil I can get? So for silicon, I see that you know, if it's a very heavy thing, I get a very nice, big, large number. Right? So that's, you know, uh, we have uh, tens of kV, hundreds of kV. We're in good shape. Right? So that's an easy signal to see. As I go to lighter and lighter dark matter, the amount of recoil gets smaller and smaller. And I, you know, I, here I'm at you know, 10 to the minus 4 EV. That's a really tiny number, especially for a particle physicist. right? So that gives me a bound on the lower side of what I might be able to see from a nuclear recoil. Now, but why doesn't it keep going to the, to the right? So on the left, I can understand. I just run out of energy. What about on the right? Well. I can write down how many dark matter particles there are per liter. And again, I know what the density is. So as the particle becomes more massive, there are less and less of them, right? Because each of them has more mass. So to the right, I start running out of particles. But we already know that there's a small cross-section uh, for dark matter. And so at, 
as I get for uh, heavier and heavier uh, dark matter particles, there's just less of them, so it becomes more and more uh, infrequent when I would actually see an event. So what can I do? Well, I can that bounds kind of my nuclear recoil type of interaction. I can also look for electron recoils. So I say, well, electrons are a lot lighter, and so if I look at the recoil of uh, dark matter to an electron, as the dark matter gets lighter, the kinematics work better for an electron, right? The problem is if I think of my atom of my target as a bowling ball, and I have another bowling ball and I throw it at it, I can move the bowling ball. But if my dark matter is very light and it's like a ping pong ball, and I throw it at a bowling ball, the bowling ball isn't going to do anything, right? So it's just straight up kinematics. If I use electrons, now I'm throwing ping pong balls at ping pong balls, right? And I can again get a big uh, recoil. So I can move down this, uh, this energy scale down to, uh, you know, MEVs, maybe KEVs if I'm very, if, if I'm very uh, 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 optimistic. Um, now, as I start getting down to lower and lower uh, masses, the next thing I've ca I can look at is how many dark matter particles there are per liter, right? So now we're getting to the point where there's a lot of particles per liter, right? Because the, the mass is going down. So I can also say, well, what's the wavelength of this particle? So as I go to smaller and smaller uh, particles um, or lighter m particles, the quantum mechanics of them start to matter, right? Like they're the Broglie wavelengths start to get to the point where they start to see each other. They start to interact with each other. And so somewhere around here, I can see that the, uh, that the De Broglie wavelength and the, number and the mean distance between the particles start to overlap. So if they start to overlap, I can then start to kind of make a, div a division here where uh, dark matter over here is acting as a particle, but what happens when I have a whole bunch of particles whose wave functions are overlapping? What do they start looking more like? So if I have like, you know, gamma rays versus radio waves, what's the, the, the big difference? I mean, they're both light, right? They're both photons, but when I think of gamma rays, I think of, you know, individual gamma rays. When I think of Radio, what am I thinking of? Waves, right? We're thinking of radio waves, right? We don't think of, they are photons, but uh, we don't generally treat them as individual radio photons because there's so many of them, they're all overlapping with each other. And so when you get to the point where the dark matter is overlapping with itself, it starts acting through quantum mechanics in a coherent fashion. So when you get to these really light uh, dark matter candidates, you stop looking for individual dark matter particles, you start looking for kind of wave or coherent or resonant phenomena, right? So this is why when you talk about uh, axions, you're looking for the uh, combined uh, influence of lots of axions on a particular detector. You're very rarely looking for a single axion. Okay, so that kind of gives you the really broad view of indirect detection, what it is that we're looking for, there's a general area of very light dark matter that you would look through, you, lo you would look for, for uh, through some coherent or resonant um, interaction, and then there's the particle uh, behavior dark matter over here, where you would actually be looking for individual events in some type of detector. And we'll have people talking about axions later in the week, I believe. So I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to cover that in my lectures. So I'm going to stick to this side of the fence. Okay. All right. So let's talk about uh, how to do. Let's start with nuclear recoils. So nuclear recoils um, are very easy, simple uh, in uh, idea. You're just really looking for a coherent scattering of the dark matter into, uh, into, an uh, into uh, uh, the, the nucleus of an atom in your target. Yep. Yeah. Is 
the middle? Yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, it's just the way that I colored the, the area. But, I mean, it is hard. So it is hard from a particle point of view to detect things in this region just because the energy is very small. That doesn't mean it's not possible. And from the uh, coherence side, then you have to kind of specialize your experiments. But there are, um, I think there are ways that you could detect things in there. So it's not, I don't think any region is, is particularly um, excluded. It's just that you're going to need different techniques for each of these mass ranges, right? Any particular technique that you're using is going to be valid for some mass range, and then it's just not going to be valid for the other one. So there isn't one magical dark matter detector that can detect anything in this range, which is great because that's why we have a large experimental uh, group of people working on dark matter. Um, there are lots of different ways to do it. Okay, so you guys already talked about this, so I'm not going to talk a bit about it a lot, but you know, the, the, the very quick uh, point is that if you have WIMPs, you start off in a hot universe where they're ge being made and annihilated, and then the universe cools down, so they're only annihilating, and as the universe cools down further, they don't see each other because there's fewer of them, and so you end up with some amount of relic ab abundance where they freeze out because they don't see each other and they're all kind of flying around. And when you work this out, you get um, that they're uh, cross-section is somewhere in the weak scale. And you guys talked about this a lot last week, so that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, now, if you then say, well, let's try to figure out how do you come up with the rate that you would expect from such a, um, from such a, a particle in an experiment, um, you would start off with a couple of assumptions. So first, you got to you gotta think about the astrophysics. Now, on uh, Friday, Fabio talked a lot about the astrophysics and, uh, of, of uh, dark matter. And f from the experimentalist point of view, we're going to use the simplest possible um, approximation, which is to say, you know, dark matter is a Maxwell, uh, uh, obeys a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities. Um, and that gives you a velocity uh, at the sun. So we're, you know, this is the dark matter halo, and here's the galaxy, and we're here somewhere in the solar system. And so we're about, you know, 220 to 270 kilometers per second in terms of the velocity of the sun and the average mean velocity of dark matter uh, moving uh, through this room. And you know, this is the uh, proverbial uh, simplest spherical cow kind of. Uh, uh, approximation, right? So here's my spherical cow. Okay, so th in reality, it is much more complicated. There are tails, there's all sorts of, well, you know, streams and all sorts of stuff. But as Fabio was saying on Friday, we're, we need to pick something so that we can uh, come up with a, uh, uh, a, a method of talking to each other in terms of the experimentalists and our results, if we see dark matter, then we would start to say, okay, well, it's actually not this. How do we incorporate that information into what we're seeing? But if you're only looking for dark matter, then this is a good place to start. So if you assume that uh, that's, that that's simplification, you can say, well, what's the lo local dark matter density? And that's about 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. So if you have a mass of 60 GeV, uh, that's about 5,000 particles per cubic meter. So basically, there's about 10 wimps in a 2-liter uh, uh, Coke bottle. So there's only 10 of them. But we are not stationary with respect to the wimps, right? So the galaxy is rotating, and so the dark matter halo is not co-rotating with the disk as much a as far as we know. I mean, that is one of the questions that people are trying to answer is, is there a dark disk? Are there, is there part of the dark matter that's co-rotating? But the simplest assumption is that the dark matter has basically zero angular momentum and it's just this kind of rad uh, radially moving random uh, um, uh, motion. And so our galaxy rotating around gives us some velocity with respect to that, that dark matter. So 
um, from our point of view, we see a wind of dark matter because we're plowing through it uh, in the direction of Cygnus. And the velocity of that dark matter, um, again, it's about 220 uh, kilometers per second. So if you stick out your hand, there's about uh, 20 million dark matter particles going through your hand every second in this room right now. That sounds much better, right, than 10. So that's, all, that's a big number. So maybe that's not so bad. So how do we turn this into uh, an actual... Uh, an actual interaction rate. So you saw some of this um, on Friday, but I'm going to go over it uh, in more detail. So this is sort of the interaction uh, rate. So this is the rate per energy of the recoil. So as an experimentalist, I want to know, you know, what is the amount of energy deposited in my detector? So E sub R is the energy of recoil. Um, so the differential rate per energy bin in my detector is going to be something like this. And I'm going to go over this. So we have a part that has to do with particle theory. You know, what's my cross-section? What is the mass of the dark matter? We have uh, a part that has to do with my detector. So what is the response? So the nuclear structure uh, response of my detector um, and the reduced mass between my detector and the dark matter. And then there's a part that has to do with astrophysics. How fast are the particles moving when they hit my detector? What's their velocity distribution? So we have this reduced mass, and we can go and look at uh, all of these a little bit more detail. So when you uh, look at the astrophysics, you can... this first term up here is the integral over uh, the velocity distribution. And again, if you just assume the Maxwell-Boltzmann case, you can get a nice answer, but in reality, it's a much more complicated uh, term, and you have to put in bounds because the uh, velocity distribution cuts off at some point because if the dark matter is moving too fast, it just escapes the galaxy. Right, so there's some bound on that. Um, and so you have the minimum you have this minimum velocity, which is what is the minimum velocity that I, I can have of my dark matter to actually give me this energy recoil. If it's going too slow, then it can't produce that recoil in my detector. And when you uh, write that out, you get this simple expression for the pure Maxwellian case. And again, in reality, it's, it's more complicated. Okay. Now, the next two depend on how my dark matter interacts with, the, uh, with my detector. So we can look at different types. So the most common thing to assume is that it's a spin-independent interaction. What that means is that it's a coherent scattering of the WIMP with the entire atom. So there's a wave function, and it comes in, and it interacts with the entire atom uh, coherently because it's going so slow that it sees all of these uh, nucleons as one big object, and it scatters coherently off of it. So uh, that has some nuclear structure that has to do with the recoil. If it's going really slow, the, nucleon look, the, the, the nucleus looks like one big ball. If it starts to go faster, if it has more energy, it starts to see that it's actually different, ad di different uh, nucleons in there. And so that kind of breaks up this concept of, uh, of coherence, and that is uh, put together in this uh, form factor uh, quantity. Um, and for spin independent, this cross section goes as basically the square of the atomic mass. So the bigger the atom that I'm using, the bigger this cross-section will be. So it's nice to have really big, fat, heavy targets because you get a lot of nucleons, and this A squared helps you a lot for, for coherence. So when you put all that together, you get something like this. So this is the differential rate in units of counts per... Uh, 10, in this case, per 10, K, uh, 10 K kilograms of detector per kV per year. I just used some units so that this wouldn't be some ridiculously low number. 
And what you can see is that the differential rate is some uh, curve that's semi-exponential, that doesn't have any peaks, it doesn't have any structure to it. It's a pretty boring line. It depends on the target. So this xenon, as you can see, xenon goes down faster. This is because of this uh, nucleon form factor. So the bigger the, the target, the higher the rate because of the A squared, but the faster it drops off because the uh, uh, WIMPs start to see the structure of the nucleon when you get to higher recoil energies. So you can see how kind of that goes. And that's the um, spin independent. Now, it could be that dark matter actually interacts through a spin. We don't know. So you could think about spin dependent interactions. And here, this nuclear, uh, this nuclear structure guy now will depend on the spin of your target. And so for that, you, uh, you, need to, um, you need to calculate your cross-section, and your cross-section is going to depend on how many unpaired nucleons you have. So if you have um, a, uh, a, a target with lots of, uh, with lots of uh, nuclear angular momentum, then you'll be in good shape. Now, you can go through and look at all the different, you know, a, a table of different uh, targets and say, okay, well, which ones look like they have are good candidates? And you can see that, you know, fluorine is great. It has a pretty large, uh, a, a pretty large spin, um, but uh, other guys don't. And so when you're looking for spin-dependent uh, spin dependent interactions, your target is going to be very important. You're going to get different responses depending on what target you use. Now, of course, we don't know whether dark matter interacts through spin or not. And it's maybe not even, and it's, you know, possibly not even that simple. So there's uh, papers that have been written on effective field theories where they say, okay, well, look, I don't know what dark matter is, and I don't care. I am going to go through every single possible way that I can write a Feynman diagram of dark matter hitting something in the standard model and giving me something out, right? And so you can go down to low energies and write an effective theory where you're not trying to complete your theory at UVs. You're just saying, what is at low energy? All of the possible mechanisms by which I can have an interaction. And you can write down all of those um, operators. And there's one spin-independent operator. There are two spin-dependent operators. And then there's three velocity-dependent operators. Um, and you can get these guys to interfere. So there are eight independent parameters that you can tweak. And so if you look at these, you can find that depending on how these, uh, these are chosen, you could have a dark matter particle who will give you very different, um, very different recoil spectra for different targets. So here's two, uh, two examples where you know a silicon and xenon give you something that looks pretty uh, normal, but in fluorine it kind of drops off at lower energies. Or you can get an enhancement in particular targets. And so the point here is that to say that when we look at direct detection and we're trying to get a signal, what we're trying to do is get the initial discovery signal for dark matter. But to go from there to a UV complete theory of dark matter, there's a long road ahead. And one of the big uh, tools that we're going to have is to split the, or to look at the response through different targets because that will allow us to nail down how this target, how dark matter is interacting with the target. And so that's a very important uh, point to make, is that when you think about dark matter direct detection, it's not just, oh, one experiment side, great, let's go home. That's just the beginning. There's a lot of work to do to actually be able to get to the point where you can end up with the actual physics of what's going on. OK. Any questions on that before we move on?
the momentum transfer. Sorry, which one? Okay, spin independent four factor. Here we go. Right. So I think the the you're asking what's the this is the moment yeah. So this is just the energy and this is the momentum. They're really the same thing. It's just yeah, so it's just one is momentum and the other is energy. I was I wrote it like this just because this is what I was using here. Normally this would be f of q. So it's basically just the same thing. Just because I had written this equation with because I wanted to make explicit that this is the energy recoil, I wrote this like that. But this is just the momentum which depends on the energy and the masses. Okay. So let's talk about designing an ideal uh, WIMP detector. So first of all, as we all know, the rates that we're looking for are really, really low. And these curves are kind of featureless, featureless exponentials. And so backgrounds are a very huge part of any dark matter, um, any dark matter uh, uh, search. But the first thing you need is you need to see a signal. So in order to see a signal, you need a lot of target since the rates are so low. So you want a large exposure, which means lots of atoms and lots of time. That, that combination uh, needs to be very large. So that's, that's pretty obvious. Now, if you want to look for dark matter down here, you have a challenge, which is that, as we were talking about, when you start to go to low mass dark matter, they start looking like ping pong balls hitting these bowling balls. And you just run out of kinematics. So here is a plot of the same target mass, so in this case, um, uh, germanium, for different masses of dark matter. So this is uh, 10 GeV, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. And this is the lowest, uh, and, and this is the experimental threshold of the experiment. So for example, if my experiment can only see 4 keV or higher, then I would not be able to see anything below 7 GeV. And my rate would be very low. And so as I go to these low mass dark matter particles, I see that I need to have a very low experimental threshold to have any chance at seeing a signal. Now this is of course kinematics, so if you use a lighter target, you do better. So for example, here is an oxygen line for 5 GeV dark matter. The oxygen line has a lower total rate because of the A squared is smaller for oxygen, but you can still kinematically generate uh, higher uh, recoils to um, up to higher energies. So you want to think about that when you're looking at your target. Lighter targets give you lower overall rates, but give you access to lower mass. Does that make sense? It's just the kinematics, right? Now, in the experiment that I work on uh, in uh, Super CDMS, we're trying to find uh, dark matter that's sub GeV. And so here's a similar plot, but in a log scale. So you can see that, you know, when we're talking about one GeV or lower, one GeV is this guy right here, the amount of recoil energy you deposit into a detector gets to be really small really fast. So this is 100 EV. And so if you can't see 100 EV in your detector, you cannot see anything below one GeV. And so in order to look for dark matter in this, in, in this lower energy range, you have to lower the threshold of your detector. You have to build detectors that can see very small energy ranges. So you want to have as low an energy threshold as you can. Now, not only because, not only because, um, whoop, went the wrong way, not only because the, uh, you can get to lower masses, but even if you're looking for 10 GeV, the lower your threshold, the higher your rate. Right? So both for rate and for access to lower mass, you want the lowest um, energy threshold you can get. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is about 
backgrounds because that is really the heart of doing a dark matter search is making sure that you have the exposure to be able to see the dark matter but making sure that you can actually see the dark matter on top of all the other stuff that's hitting your detector. So here's a plot of the expected WIMP spectrum um, for a 20 GeV uh, uh, dark matter for some uh, cross section. And here is the spectrum taken uh, of a banana. Okay? So how many of you guys ate a banana this morning? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we've got five bananas in the room in somebody's stomach. Okay, so if I integrate these, I get the integral of this uh, rate is one event per kilogram per year. Whereas a banana at about a meter away gives me 100 events per kilogram per second from a banana. So all five of you all are fired from dark matter experiments. So we want no bananas near dark matter experiments because they're radioactive, see? But, but there is one important thing is that these are nuclear recoils. And these are electron recoils. So if we can distinguish between them, that gives us a handle to get to throw away all of these banana events. All right, so most of these backgrounds are, um, are from trace radioactivity. So we don't have a whole bunch of bananas around our experiment, but we have concrete, we have you know, shielding, we have other stuff. And most of that has trace uh, uranium, thorium um, in it. And so we want to be able to look at the difference between gammas, so electron recoils, or betas that usually happen on the surface or in the bulk depending on the, uh, on, on the uh, origin. And those are going to, of course, hit our electrons in our target versus neutrons and dark matter that are going to hit the, uh, the, the nuclei of our target. So if we can distinguish between those two things, we can throw away these electron recoils we can't throw away the, nuclear, the, the neutrons because they uh, recoil in the same way. So you have to make sure that you have as low a rate of those as you can. So the first thing, so this is how you manage your background. So you really want uh, radio pure materials um, so that um, you can have as low an in intrinsic rate on your detector as you can. So how do you do that? Well, you have to screen your materials. Like when we're building an experiment, you actually have to go and buy stuff. Like I'm going to build an uh, experiment out of germanium. I have to go buy germanium. That germanium is going to go into some housing that I'll make out of copper. Well, I have to go buy that copper. And not all copper from all vendors are going to be the same. So you actually have to talk to the people that you're buying the materials for your experiment and make them as radio pure as possible. And we do that by coordinating with the vendors and by measuring the radio purity ourselves. So you go in and you, me you measure the, the purity of everything that's going to go into your experiment, including the bolts, including any string that you use, you know, whatever you're going to put in there, you want to measure it to make sure that you're not putting something in there that's going to be really hot and throwing gamma rays at you all the time and it's going to kill your experiment. You have to measure um, uh, what, you're, what you're going to use. And if you can't find something that's pure enough, then you build it yourself. So for example, we were working with uh, PNNL where they electroform copper. Um, they, they basically use uh, chemical uh, processes to grow copper in a very, very pure, very low radioactivity con uh, concentration copper that they're using for experiments like Majorana or for neutrino uh, 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 experiments or for CDMS or other low background required uh, experiments. Um, you can also take the, uh, the offending uh, radioactive substances out of your 
experiment. So if you have xenon, you can actually build a distillation column that will purify that xenon and will take out radioactive uh, isotopes like krypton out of your uh, out of your xenon. So you can basically try to either build it clean or clean it after you get it. So the second thing is that in here, we're getting showered by cosmic rays, right? There's tons of cosmic rays going around. Those cosmic rays produce fast neutrons by hitting the concrete and knocking neutrons off stuff, and then those neutrons come in and hit your detector, and as we said, those neutrons can't be distinguished from WIMPs. So we want to get away from all those muons that are coming down from cosmic rays. And you do that by having a big shield between you and your detector. And that shield is just a ton of Earth. And so you got to go deep. So you go deep underground um, to as steep as you can go to uh, get away from this flux of muons. So this is the flux of muons and fast neutrons as a function of the effective depth in uh, kilometers of water equivalent. So it's, you know, Earth has different compositions, so you kind of normalize it to what it would be if you were under a certain amount of water. So you want to go deep to get rid of all those muons that produce those fast neutrons that can mimic a dark matter signal. Now, you're still going to have radioactivity because you're going to be underground and the walls of your cave are made of rock, and rock has trace amounts of stuff. So you're still going to have to deal with the radioactive environment even though you killed your muons. So you still have to shield your detectors. So you need um, a lot of uh, passive or active shielding. So this is an example from my experiment Super CDMS. We have you know, 10 centimeters polyethylene. Well, we, we go out here, we have, ten, uh, we have 40 centimeters of polyethylene to stop neutrons. Then we have um, a bunch of lead to stop all the gammas coming in. Then we have a, a thin layer of ancient lead. And this is ancient lead is lead that has been uh, recovered from Spanish or you know, so from galleons that were sunk and have been underwater for hundreds of years, and the lead has had time to decay, and because they're underwater, uh, cosmic rays haven't been able to reactivate it. And so this is very low radioactivity lead. So even though we're using lead to stop the radioactivity from the walls, this